Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to extend this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, December 31st. It is New Year's Eve. This will be the last time that we will refer to this year as 2023. We will sing a few songs this evening, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message, hopefully kind of uh, appropriate to the new year, perhaps. Uh, here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. I'm sure that some of you have that book, and maybe some of you don't. I will give you the name of the song and the number, give you time to get it in your songbook or Google it so that you can sing along with us. <clears throat> the first song that we will sing this evening is number 422. The title is Spirit of the Living God. We'll sing it through two times. Spirit of the Living God. <clears throat> Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Mount me, mold me. song will be number uh, 238. You are the song that I sing. 238. You are the song that I sing. <clears throat> you are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Before the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 354, I Gave My Life for Thee. 354, I Gave My Life for Thee. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? 
My Father's house of light, my glory circle throne. I love for earthly night, for wandering sad and long. I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left all for me? I left, I left it all for thee. Hast thou left all for me? I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell. A bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I born, I born it all for thee. What hast thou born for me? I born, I born it all for thee. What hast thou born? for me, and I am brought to thee, down from my home above, salvation full and free, my pardon and my love, I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee, what hast thou brought for me? I bring, I bring rich gifts to thee. What hast thou brought for me? We are told as Christians uh, to gather together on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is Sunday. Uh, in Jewish times, uh, Sabbath was Saturday, and so let's not confuse uh, our Saturday and our Sunday, the first day of the week. And in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it tells us that on the first day of the week, and this was what, when Paul was at Troas preaching, that they gathered together to break bread. This is the command. This is the command that is given to us, explaining that on the first day of the week, we are to remember the supper of the Lord. Jesus instituted that supper on the night in which he was betrayed when he was in the upper room with his disciples. He explained to them uh, as he had before, even though the, they did not fully understand at that time, that he would give up his life, that he would be a one-time sacrifice. And uh, in commemoration, um, to, to remember, uh, they were to partake of symbols of his body and of his blood. And thus, it has come down to us. And the Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, almost word for word, explained it to us again, that on the first day of the week, they were to gather together and to break bread. The bread is a symbol of the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that was nailed to the cross, the agony that he uh, suffered. The fruit of the vine represents the blood that he shed, the blood that is the blood of our salvation, the blood that uh, is uh, shed and was shed by Jesus to wash away our sins. So as we gather, let's just in heart and in mind uh, remember this this magnificent sacrifice that jesus made jesus didn't have to come to earth he didn't have to do this but in the wisdom of our god it was uh, seen that he would take the form of a man he would live as a man and for three and a half years he would go about on his mission journey and finally he would be the one-time sacrifice. No longer would bulls and goats be sacrificed, but Jesus would be sacrificed. And just as when the Jews sacrificed under the old covenant, they were expected to bring the best 
for sacrificing. Jesus is indeed the best. And so with that in mind, let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that in your divine wisdom at just the right time, you sent Jesus to us. We are so grateful that he lived the perfect life. We're so grateful for his teachings. We're so grateful for uh, his uh, willingness to go to the cross. And so as we partake of this bread, we remember the agony that he suffered nails in his hands and feet, a crown of thorns upon his head. And we just remember that, and we remember that his body was given in our stead. As we take of this bread, help us to remember that he gave up his body for us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The scriptures tell us in a like manner he took the cup and when they had finished he said this is drink you all of it uh, this is the blood of the new covenant let's pray for the fruit of the vine our God and Heavenly Father let's just for a moment remember the blood that flowed from Jesus's body as he died on the cross that life-giving blood that uh, courses through all of our bodies. We understand through science what uh, blood means to us and its importance. And as the blood flowed from Jesus, his life ebbed away. Help us to remember this is the blood of our salvation. This is the blood that washes away our sins. As we partake, let's bring our sins to you. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, we are also told on the first day of the week, the first day of the week, we are to lay by in store that which we have prospered. And you know, there are so many similarities to the giving part of uh, our uh, service to the Lord and the Lord's uh, crucifixion. Uh, that is that uh, Jesus gave all, he made a sacrifice. And in our giving, if our giving is not a sacrifice, it's not really giving. We are to give as we have prospered. We are to give understanding that all we have comes from our true living God. And as we give back, help us to uh, uh, remember how important that giving is. Let's pray. We just thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the opportunity we have at this time to give back to you. We know that uh, uh, the church of the uh, 21st century is one in which uh, we are told to go out and evangelize just as Jesus said in the Great Commission, to go into all the world. And we know that uh, our voices in a small place are limited. And so with these monies, I pray that we will do what the church of today is supposed to do, bring others to Christ. We're also told to feed the needy, and we pray that some of these monies will be used just for that. Bless us in our giving. Help us to do cheerfully as we are, give cheerfully as we are instructed to do. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we'll sing is number 681, a favorite of mine, More Holiness Give Me. Six eighty one, More Holiness Give Me. <clears throat> more holiness give me more strivings within, 
more patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of His care, more joy in His service, more purpose in prayer, more gratitude give me, more trust in the Lord, more pride in His glory, more hope in His word, more tears for His sorrows, more pain at his grief, more meekness and trial, more praise for relief, more purity give me, more strength to overcome, more freedom from earth stains, more longings for home, more fit for the kingdom, more useful I'd be, more blessed and only, more Savior like Thee. That concludes our song service. I know that the Lord was glorified in our songs. And I know that we were lifted up, doing what we're supposed to do, praising the Lord of our creation. It is a new year. I remember uh, when I was a teacher, uh, the transition from the old year to the new year. I remembered how often I would always uh, put down the past year. It took a long time to adjust to the fact that we were in a new year. And our new year will be 2024, as this is the last day, uh, December 31st of 2023. And so, my lesson this evening has to do with new. And the title is, A New Beginning. You know, a, a new year is upon us, and it's a great time to obtain a new beginning. Maybe we want to get rid of some of our bad habits. I'm not going to get into New Year's resolutions, but it will almost seem like I'm, I'm talking about that. Uh, we may uh, resolve to improve our lives on several different levels. Whatever our desire uh, to improve is that we can't start any later than starting today. It's not really a New Year thing, but we're reminded of it at the New Year. First, uh, the covenant that Jesus gave us is the new covenant. It wasn't enacted until Jesus died and rose on the third day. And with that, the part of our Bibles that we come to refer as the New Testament became the important part of our lives. The eternal destiny for those that are faithful to God. Uh, the writer of Revelation in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 says that new heavens and new earth, there's that term new again new heavens, and a new earth. And you know what? It would seem to me that the most important time in a person's life is when he or she becomes a new person. A new person. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you ready? He is a new creature. 
That's a new person. The old things have passed away. New things have come. A new beginning. You may have guessed that this is a salvation lesson because salvation is the new beginning of people's lives. The New Testament teaches us that when one is forgiven of his or her sins, that person is a new person. Now, with that, the new person says, um, I don't want to do the things that I used to do. I want to change my lifestyle. That term is called repentance. And with that, they want to figuratively and literally bury their old sinful self and being raised after having been immersed in the waters of baptism to walk in a new life. Now again, from the pen of the Holy Spirit inspired uh, Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Romans in Romans chapter six, verses three and four, puts it this way. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. This goes back to the previous scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, anyone who is in Christ becomes a new person. The old things have passed away. Now, the Roman scripture, Romans 6, 3 to 4, is very specific. And there's no real way uh, to get around that verse. One becomes a new creation when one is in Christ. And it tells us how to get in Christ. It says, we were baptized into his death. We were immersed in baptism. And that comparison that Paul makes was that Christ died, was buried, and was raised to walk a new life. In that same way, one dies to sin, determined to live in sin no longer, is buried and raised to walk a new life. Now, I didn't just pull this out of the air. Uh, the conversions that are taught to us in our New Testament are biblical conversions. It started on the day of Pentecost when the Apostle Peter preached that great, wonderful sermon in Acts chapter 2. And when he was speaking to the Jews and he convicted them that they were the ones that had crucified Christ, they wanted to what they wanted to know what they could do to make recompense for that. And Peter said it to them. You know, they were convicted of their sin and they wanted to be forgiven of that sin. And so in chapter two, verse thirty eight, we have those famous words. It says uh, then those who had received his words were baptized. They were no longer sinners, but now they were new people. That's what it says a couple of verses later in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So from the very beginning, the first converts in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost were told to be baptized, to wash their sins away. Perhaps my favorite conversion story is the one of the Ethiopian eunuch or the Ethiopian uh, uh, treasurer. We know that he was the treasurer for a queen in Ethiopia and he'd been to Jerusalem. And he had been to Jerusalem 
to worship according to the law of Moses. That's what it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 27. And you know what? He didn't know that Christ had come. He didn't know that Christ had died. He didn't know that Christ was resurrected from the dead. And so when, when, uh, Philip got into the chariot with him, uh, the Ethiopian was obviously reading from the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. And from that, it talks about Jesus, the Messiah. And, uh, I am sure that Philip explained fully to him that that Messiah has come, that he has lived, he has died, and he has been resurrected from the dead. And he also obviously told the Ethiopian what he must do to be saved. And so in verse 36, it says they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And it says he ordered the chariot to be stopped and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. What happened to the Ethiopian? He became a new person. And he was so joyful, it says in verse 39, that he went away rejoicing. Another fascinating conversion is the conversion of Saul, or Paul. It is recounted for us in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, and the 26th chapter. Saul, to become Paul, was a devout Jew. And he thought that Jesus was a blasphemer. And being a Pharisee, a Jew among Jews, he decided that his lot in life was to persecute these people who followed this blasphemer. When Saul had Jesus appear to him on the road to Damascus, this convinced Saul that he had seen the Messiah. <clears throat> And with that, he asked, what shall I do? Chapter 22 and verse 10. He was told to go into a city, the city, Damascus, and someone would tell him what he needed to do. Chapter 9, verse 6. A Christian there named Ananias took him in. And when he had been there, Ananias told him what he must do. In chapter 22, verse 16, he said, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And so, as we have seen from other examples, Saul had to be baptized to wash away his sins. And with this obedient faith, guess what? Saul found the new beginning. Saul, as who we become known, who has become known to us as Paul, found a new beginning. Why? Because he was in Christ and he was a new creature. All of the examples of people in our New Testament, uh, and, and it's recorded for us very succinctly, had all this in common. They were forgiven of their sins. They were immersed in water for their forgiveness of our sins. This was the biblical example. It has come down, it has come down through time to us today. I found one of the more fascinating stories was the story of Nicodemus in John chapter three, verse three. Jesus had not yet died. Jesus had not yet resurrected from the dead. And so the new covenant wasn't in in force as yet. But Nicodemus, a Pharisee, said, uh, what do I have to do? And Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And he went on to explain it to him. He said, this is what being born again means. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 5. The water is the water in which one is baptized. The Spirit's part in one's conversion is that the Spirit convicts each person of their sins that he or she has committed. He does that as the Word of God. And as the Word of God is preached and heard and believed, each individual, according to John 16, 8, Acts 2, 22, Ephesians 6, 17, is taught what the plan of salvation is. If this sounds like a conversion lesson, it is. And so the invitation uh, this evening is going to be a part of the lesson. If you have not started your new beginning, just as we are changing from 2023 to 2024, a new year is upon us. A new beginning is possible for all, and that is being baptized for the remission of our sins. The steps are clear. We have the Holy Spirit-inspired word that we can read from. And as we understand that the Holy Spirit guided the pens of those who wrote it, that we can be assured that the words are the words of truth. And that those words say that we have to believe this message. And then, uh, just as uh, the Jews did, just as the Ethiopian did, just as Saul or Paul did, we have to repent of our former lives. And with that, we must be buried in the waters of baptism. Let's remember that. And if you are not a child of God, all of this is about a new beginning. And you can have your new beginning by coming to the Lord. So if you need to come to the Lord, please get in touch with one of us and we will do everything that we can to help you to have that new beginning. I would like to end this with a, a prayer for the new year. May the Lord make my new year a happy one not by shielding me from sorrow and pain, by, but by strengthening me to bear it if it comes. Not by taking hardship from me, but by taking all cowardice and fear from my heart as I meet hardships. Not by making my path easy, but by making me sturdy enough to tread any path not by granting unbroken sunshine, but by keeping my face bright even in the shadows. Not by making my life always pleasant, but by showing me where others and his cause need me most and by making me zealous to be there and to help. I hope that is our prayer this evening. I pray that you would um, just take these words into your hearts and that they would be useful to you. I ask that you be safe and God bless you all. Ah!